Welcome to episode 576 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Dan Holton, and thank you for joining me for what is, without hyperbole, the biggest five headlines that I have done in a long, long time. I'm talking about four, five years' time. Messi was still in his late 20s the last time I felt like there was a, well, it was actually before I did the five headlines, but the last time I had a Barca piece of content that felt this big. Honestly, just enjoying the nerves that come along with a huge European night of football, you can hear it in my voice. It's the knockout round of the Champions League, and that brings a different excitement to this. The World Cup final was a last moment, and then I was just rooting for Messi, not the team I talk and think about every single day when I really felt this excited about a single 90 minutes. So before I jump into the headlines, special shout out to my patrons for making these shows possible. And if you could, if you're new here, subscribing to the YouTube channel or good rating on the podcast apps, that's the best way to help out the show. Now, let's dive in to five headlines from Barcelona's 3-2 win over PSG. Headline one is that's how you defend for a half at least with quotes around that for a half. Let's set the scene first before I get into all the defending and the early parts of this game. I think the yellow card suspensions, certainly they were getting thrown out there, and it was something that I had on my mind throughout the whole game, including Ronald Araujo and a not match fit De Young. So we know that Christensen and Roberto, they wind up going in the book, but I think it's almost a fortunate thing that Araujo and De Young and Lamini Mall, also on that list, didn't pick up those yellows. There was also a Gundogan scare in the warm-up, but he seemed to be fine, was able to play for at least 70 minutes. And Christensen, I don't think he was fully fit, even though a little bit of gamesmanship. Xavi was saying that he was, but he also didn't start. I was also confused that people were saying, oh, the sky is falling because it's a pivot of Roberto, but it wasn't. It was a double pivot of Roberto and De Jong with Gundogan farther forward. So the questions about Roberto, I don't really have many. I'm not talking about his performance in the game, but from the opening whistle about who you start in this match, it kind of had to be Roberto because Christensen wasn't fully fit, and you're going to want Gundogan farther forward instead of Fermin Lopez, because starting Fermin Lopez is going to drop Gundogan in a bit deeper. But starting Roberto, who came into this match in some fine form, at least by his standards, had to be the pick. It was surprising from Luis Enrique, though, that he also did not start Warren Zaire Emery, and I know he winds up making a mistake, but he's arguably been PSG's maybe not their best player, but a consistent player in their midfield who's been really good this season. And I was kind of shocked not to see the teenager get the start. And then the other two big notes from the starting lineup, Lamini Mall becoming the youngest ever player to play in the UEFA Champions League from the quarterfinal stage onwards, surpassing Lyon's Rion Cherki's record from 2021. And Kubar C became the youngest ever defender to start in UEFA Champions League quarterfinal. So as a constant reminder with Kubar C and Lamini Mall, they shouldn't be here. It doesn't make sense to be that young and be in this position, but here we are and here they are. For as hot-blooded as this rivalry, which I'll say in the last podcast, I didn't necessarily say it was the biggest rivalry, but I think the fans for both these sides surely have been going back and forth and showing up for this one. But you could see there was a little bit of love between these two teams, too, in the pregame stuff. Xavi, Luis Enrique embracing and talking it over. Gabi and the Spanish players talking to their former Spanish national team manager in Luis Enrique and all that. The stars were out. They were in the stands, but they were on the field as well. And this did feel like a proper European night. So it did already take me about five minutes to set up what was an incredible match. So let's jump in. Within the first minute, an early foul on Dembele by Cancelo, setting the scene for this match and giving PSG a free kick in the first minute. Cancelo, though, got Dembele back a few minutes later with a step-in tackle. PSG were also mirroring lineup-wise that double pivot with Fabian Ruiz and Vitinha, which did kind of bring up the idea of is it Xavi, is it Luis Enrique, who is playing with the most quote-unquote, and I roll my eyes directly into the back of my head for this when I say Barca DNA, but I did find it really interesting that these two teams were mirroring each other in terms of their build-up and their tactics. PSG did come out firing, though, Mbappe getting his first shot off in the fifth minute with Barca having little possession, but then the other way, showing you what the game plan was, at least to start that game until they could settle in. It was Route 1 football, Rafinha in behind from Ter Stegen, but Donnarumma came off his line and got it right as he came out of the penalty box sliding in. Asensio got a shot in the 11th minute, Cancelo and De Jong a miscommunication on the switch, and Dembele got free, which we know Luis Enrique figured out a bit later, more on that. Nice job by Barca, though, defending that first team minutes. I don't want to understate this. Araujo slowing down Mbappe enough for Cooney to get back in transition. Same on the other side with Cancelo and De Jong. I know things got a little shaky there in the second half as players got tired. And there were moments, certainly, when Barcelona did not have control of that game in the first half. But Xavi got this game plan right. And you could tell by how monumental and immense Araujo and Cunde were all evening. 
This is both their individual success and the defensive game plan. Kune was immense all night, individually, dealing with Mbappe, but also recognizing that the game plan was not for him to do it alone. It was to make sure that Mbappe did not cut him inside, did not get to that inside shoulder, and give himself enough time for either Gundogan to come back and help him defend from behind or Rajo sliding over once they had those PSG attackers man-marked in anticipation of a ball coming in. PSG also started well in this game by unbalancing Barca on the press, forcing Ter Stegen to go long quite a bit. That said, Barcelona survived by being wise to try to build out on the wings instead of giving over the ball in the middle of the field and losing their duels that way. Once again, until they found the game, just kind of surviving when you're not ready and the home team with a raucous atmosphere began well. Terrific defending from Araujo around the 20th minute after Nuno Mendes nutmeg Kunde. PSG pushing Mendes high to play Mbappe 2v2 on the left side. That was the early game plan, which obviously we know Luis Enrique would switch for the second half. And by pushing Nuno Mendes high, that meant that there was a lot of space in transition behind through Rafinha as long as he was willing to continue running and his teammates were finding him, which right after that nutmeg on Kunde going the other way, Barca won two corners and had three chances with Rafinha in transition in particular. Barca on the corner, it was saved off the line by Nuno Mendes. Those were the first real moments that you felt like Barcelona, even though they haven't had much control, they had the best opportunities there in the first 20 minutes or so. Lewandowski was the one who got his head up to it, getting up there, and Donnarumma getting the smallest touch for Nuno Mendes to hit it off the line. PSG, they weren't starting the tallest team. This is a bit of foreshadowing, but Araujo and Lewandowski at that point showing you they had a little bit of height over every PSG player other than Donnarumma. Donnarumma, though, brave on this set piece coming off his line, but foreshadowing things to come. The first real good build-up sequence from Barca came in the 23rd minute and led to a long effort from Rafinha that Donnarumma had to get down for, and if not for the Italian keeper starting this game on his toes, PSG would have been down even though I think Barcelona started on the back foot. Headline two is European quality goal. By this point, though, around the 23rd to 26th minute, Barca did really settle down there. They survived. They didn't concede the early goal, and I thought that was a win. And then they began to play with confidence. They also started winning their duels, which for two midfields, I could say out of those six players, none of them are natural ball winners. But once Barcelona started to narrow the field a bit, and especially Lewandowski was winning his duels, then Gundogan, De Jong, and Settle, they also began recognizing the space and when to make those good decisions to drive or work the pass. Lewandowski also won seven of his nine duels in that first half, and huge, huge European night for him too. 28th minute, Ter Stegen stopped the shot from Kang In Lee, and fortunately Mbappe was offside because Cancel absolutely fouled him for what would have been a penalty. Kinsella, you saw it more in the second half too, but offensively, a European quarterfinal player. Defensively, oh boy, kind of a European quarterfinal winger, not a defender. Another corner opportunity right after that was a goal-bound shot from Afinha, blocked again by PSG, but they couldn't stop the 1-0. 37th minute, Kubarsi, a tremendous ball to Lewandowski to bypass the PSG midfield. Lewandowski turned on a dime and Lamine Yamal the pass early. Everybody crashed toward the middle, Barca players, PSG players, including the keeper, except for Rafinha, who had time to compose himself and hit it first time. And it had to be a hard finish that was aimed to that top corner as two PSG shirts were at the goal line, but it didn't matter. It's the first European goal for Rafinha, who earned his goal with his tireless running, trying to get in behind, working off of Lewandowski and helping Cancelo defend in that first half against Dembele on the right. Everybody for Barcelona had to play their part on this goal, and that's why I say it was a European quality goal. If Kubarsi does not bypass the PSG midfield with that pass to Lewandowski, then Barcelona don't have the numbers in transition. Lewandowski had to turn and had to play the early ball to Lamine Mall to get himself going forward. Lamine Mall had to deliver it early. His long distance crossing wasn't the best this game, but this was exactly what the doctor ordered, and the ball had to fall into the path of Rafinha the way it did who took that breath and had to hit it first time. So again, everybody for Barcelona doing their job here. Nice goal. To close out the first, they had to do a bit of nervy defending, almost a terrible mistake by De Jong, but Barca did survive to the halftime whistle with that lead, leaving the big question for the second half, would Barca be punished for missing their chances? Headline three, Luis Enrique's halftime adjustment. You knew that there would be some changes. Luis Enrique is too good of a manager not to. And at halftime, he basically admitted his mistake, I guess. But also Barcola may not have been fully even 90 minutes fit. So Luis Enrique wanted him to come on in the second half. Maybe the game plan was always to have him start if he had been fit, but he wasn't. 
So Barcola on for Asensio on to the right, and Demele technically in the middle, but obviously shading to the left, with Mbappe also coming in the middle and shading to the left to unbalance Barca. The first chance in the second half, it was long from Vitinha because Roberto, who already picked up a yellow in the first half and will miss the second leg, got beat. Roberto clearly ran out of gas, and all of his detractors obviously got their vindication because he was really poor in that second half. Once Dembele became the free man, there was just too much speed now in the middle of the field for Roberto and De Jong to be able to track those late runners from the midfield. So the 1-1 came early in the second half through Dembele. Barca didn't win the duel in the midfield the way they did in the first half. And they have to do that or else it'll be a numerical advantage for PSG. Dembele to the left and then Mbappe and Dembele in a 2v2 situation. Araujo didn't clear far enough. His one and only mistake, I'd say, of the night. So it goes to Dembele and then De Jong. This one's mainly on him. Completely faked out of his boots and Dembele unloaded. A lot of power and no chance for Ter Stegen. It was only his second goal in a PSG uniform, and boy, did Dembélé celebrate here. I think there are still a few unresolved feelings about his time at Barca and for kool in general, and I think you saw some of that in his celebration. Within two minutes, PSG scored the second. Barcola got it wide and was played back to Ruiz, and he sent Vitinho through. Was it De Jong that wasn't tracking properly? I think so, and Ter Stegen probably should have done a little bit better to cut down this angle, and Vitinho winds up scoring to make it 2-1. Barcola also forced a Ter Stegen save off the bar five minutes later, and those goals also gave PSG new life in this game, and they really turned up the heat on Barcelona within the first 15 minutes of that second half, and this game could have got ugly. Headline four is welcome back, Pedri. While the game could have gotten ugly, it didn't get ugly. Both teams started, you could see, get tired legs because this game was end-to-end for so much of it. And when you don't have a natural controller, the Busquets type, or even natural ball winners that are doing all that job for you, and you have guys who aren't used to banging bodies the way that that midfield for PSG and Barcelona aren't used to, guys tire out. And all the running that all the attackers were doing, defending for both sides as well. Rafinha, especially, looked absolutely gassed by the 60th minute, and he deserved to be. He was Barcelona's most important runner as I had said in the first half, helping to defend with Cancelo, but also being the main man to make his runs off of Lewandowski as Lewandowski did a really good job on the night to drop in. And that was Rafinha's job. Go out wide when you need to, be the one to cut inside to get that ball to the far sideline for Lamini Mall, who wasn't really coming inside much on the night. Even if Rafinha didn't have a goal, an excellent showing by him, arguably one of his best, maybe his best in a Barca uniform. 61st minute, here come the subs. Warren's at your Emery, as I had mentioned, on for Kang and Lee to fortify that midfield and win some more of those 50-50s for PSG. Pedri and Jao Felix on for Roberto and Lamine Mall, who wasn't sharp on the day and maybe not truly fit. But I also think that Xavi was trying to save him because tired legs make you more susceptible to yellow cards. So I think this is the right move to not risk him for that second leg when I expect him to be even better than he was today. And he was fine. He wasn't bad. He was just fine. But do you know who was really good? The guy that hasn't played in a few months. With Rafinha looking gassed, Pedri comes on to support him in the midfield, and his ability to retain the ball and build up in vertical space better than Roberto does, who is a bit more horizontal, that allowed Goodwin to once more push a bit farther forward, and that gave Rafinha even more room to work with if he had the lungs. And he did have the lungs, and he did make the right run. He almost looked a bit shocked that Pedri even delivered this ball. I think it was one of those runs that you kind of make to hope that it opened up room for somebody else. But no, Pedri delivers this on a dime. What a wonderful ball. And then another tremendous finish by Rafinha. For a guy who's not known as a quote-unquote goal scorer, he came up huge in this match. Man of the match for me. 69th minute, a bit of luck for PSG, was a free kick for Barcelona because Vitinha was fortunate not to get a second yellow for the clip on Lewandowski in transition. It would have been a first yellow, certainly, so why isn't a second yellow? I think the referee just decided it's a little too harsh for a second yellow, but a rule's a rule. I think it should have been a second. That leads to a Rafinha free kick that went low and hard, but Donnarumma didn't spill a rebound. And a reminder, too, that Donnarumma, like Ter Stegen, I thought they were both pretty important in that first half, and this game could have been much worse for either side with the number of times that these goalkeepers had to come up big. The other way, Araujo slid in to stop Barcola, who had Ter Stegen backpedaling. Barcola got inside of Cancelo, and this is, once again, terrific from Araujo, who is the other candidate for man of the match in this game for me. Jao Felix had a long shot that the gigantic Donnarumma had covered, and at this point, it was the best buildup for Barca in the second half. And it comes through Gundogan and Pedri, who really did look like they missed playing with each other. I will reiterate that Pedri was really sharp despite being gone for a while. And it's nice to see whatever mental preparation he did along with the physical had him ready to go. 
Moments later, Vitinha plays Dembele on, and he opens up his body for that far pose, but it bounces off the outside. A little bit of luck for Barcelona, and the kind of luck that went against Dembele in Europe that Barca fans are very familiar with. And headline five is Barca belief. So after that quote-unquote miss from Dembele, 75th minute, Rafinha and De Jong off for Torres and Christensen. And within minutes, Barcelona get the winner. The 3-2, Christensen on the set piece immediately after coming on with PSG's lack of height that I foreshadowed in the first half. That was a concern for PSG. Talking to PSG, talk on the podcast, that was the one weakness more than any other that he had mentioned PSG had. And Gundogan delivers this one Perfect spin on it with enough speed that Donnarumma was kind of stuck on his line, but enough loft for Christensen to get up and have the tallest man meet it. Zero Emery also didn't put a body on the Dane, so that was quite helpful. And as I said, Donnarumma was stuck on his line, and Barcelona gets the lead. And that belief, if you've been with me even all the way back to 2017, you know that belief in Europe and Barcelona, usually don't go in the same sentence. But the thing I will reiterate about Xavi and his entire tenure in charge of Barcelona There is naivety sometimes in the way that he manages. Even the way that he allows the media to affect him and the Entorno, there's a bit of naivety in a young manager. But this is a team that wants to play for Xavi, that has had his ear and has followed him and wanted to play for him. And I think we can all agree that he did lose them a little bit. I I think especially the veterans. There's a reason why Lewandowski, since Xavi announced that he was leaving, it seemed to kickstart something in him. Maybe he's feeling a bit healthier, but Lewandowski has been good. Over this entire unbeaten run since that moment, the veterans, Araujo, Kunde, they have stepped up their game since Xavi announced that he was leaving. There is belief in this team, both offensively and like they did when they won the Liga last season, defensively in this match. I know PSG scored the two goals, but watch the other quarterfinals from yesterday as well between Real Madrid and Man City and Arsenal and Bayern Munich. Attacking football is at its premium right now in Europe, and all of these sides can put a lot past you on a European night. So Barcelona had to survive and cut their teeth to win this game. They defended narrow late. Good job by Xavi to get everybody organized after taking that 3-2 lead. And by defending late in those last few minutes with Christensen, allowing him or Pedri to drop back when the ball goes wide and just clear for your life, make them reset. PSG fans, they have a bit of an argument for sure with Christensen pulling down Vitinha. As they were in the box, maybe not a penalty because it was outside the box, was in the box, who knows. But VAR, either way, says no. The ref was letting them play. And Vitinha probably shouldn't have been in that spot if he had picked up that second yellow. So, sure, don't call a Vitinha second yellow. Don't call the Christensen pull down. Whistles not being blown. 85th minute, Gundogan off for Fermin Lopez. Gundogan, for somebody who was potentially not in this match, right during the warm-up, he played his butt off. Good showing by Gundogan and Fermin Lopez. Use those legs late, buddy. 87th minute, Dembele finds himself open at the far side of the box. Barca's back line stepped up, so Mbappe had to hold his run. And that was the difference here. He could only dive at the header opportunity that Dembele either shot or crossed in. Because this is the moment, I didn't really mention him other than the pass, but Kubarsi, another huge night. I'm being repetitive, but he has been unbelievable. And I cannot imagine that he is not your starter at center back with Araujo if they're both healthy, and if Araujo is still a member of FC Barcelona next season, that is your starting pair to begin next season. There is no doubt in my mind, and the idea that this kid could get better as long as you rotate him and protect him, because he did just turn 17, so as long as you protect him, my goodness, Kubarsi is just unbelievable to have a center back this young and this good. Yes, he has the record of being the youngest ever defender to start in a Champions League quarterfinal, but that isn't out of necessity. It's his spot. He's earned it. Gosh, he's good. To close out the game, 88th minute, Christensen got a yellow, and he will be suspended for the second leg. It did preserve Barca's win, and we'll see what happens in the second leg, but if you were to ask me, okay, rotation for Cadiz, and that means that De Jong, Gundogan, and Pedri are going to start that second leg, and Fermi Lopez will come off the bench if you really, truly need to. You have Oro Romeo for the last 15 minutes to try to preserve what you'd hope would be a victory in the tie. You have that as an option, but the question would be, would you rather have Christensen for the second leg or have Barca won this game? I know that question isn't as linear, but that is a decision that Christensen had to make in that half second. He didn't want to give that lane and concede a goal. He wanted to make sure they preserved the win, and now they go home up, but without Christensen and Roberto. Barca did play with a little bit of fire late. Cancelo and Jao Felix, not good here. They were giving up the ball too easily and pushing numbers forward. We just felt naive from Cancelo and Jao Felix. So some late chances for PSG, but Barca survived. 
Araujo had another block on a long-range effort from Kylian Mbappe that was definitely goal-bound. Araujo has been known, like most defenders in the world, for just a rare moment when he can turn off, but not a single second did Ron Araujo turn off on the night. He was on all night defensively, throwing his body, keeping his arms into his chest. Huge monster performance from Araujo. And all of this is still left to play for next week because of the effort by Barcelona defensively. And this is for a spot in the semifinals of the Champions League with this Barca squad, with a manager who already announced his departure. It makes me think of that Paul Rudd meme from that show Hot Ones on YouTube when he says that very memeable line, hey, look at us. Who would have thought? Not me. When I started this season, I just prayed that Barcelona were not out in the group stage of the Champions League again, because what that does for me and my mental health and the challenges of covering a Barcelona team that fails to even to be close to their expectations is always a task. And it winds up not even being days of frustration, but weeks and weeks and months. So to be here, I'm proud of the team and I'm proud of us for being with the team and getting to this spot. As a programming note, the plan right now is to review this tie again in podcast form because this was a pretty long five headlines and my nerves are pretty high. So I'm going to take a few breaths, calm down a little bit, and then be able to talk about this with a clearer head in a few days. So the plan is to record that late on Friday night so you can look out for that show on Saturday morning ahead of the return leg on Tuesday. In the meantime, again, a special thank you to the patrons who get these shows without the ads for as low as $3. And please remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel and on the podcast apps. And I say it every time, but these are the nights that I really get to enjoy saying it. As always, until next time, I'll talk to you soon and force the bar side.